The baby boomers are in charge now. The United States has undergone a cultural, moral, and religious revolution. And a militant secularism has arisen in this country. It's always had a hold on the intellectual and academic elites. But in the 1960s, it captured the young in the universities and the colleges. And we had this great battle cultural war begin then nationally. And since then, if you will, secularism has, has really achieved dominance in the academic community and the intellectual community and the entertainment community in Hollywood, uh, among part of the, uh, the political community, but not the nation as a whole. However, it is much stronger than it was, and so this is the basis of the great cultural war we're undergoing uh, right now. And this militant, it is an anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-traditionalist revolution. It's partly a, the sexual resolute revolution has a lot to do with it and how people live. And so we are two countries now. We are two countries morally and socially and culturally and theologically. And cultural wars do not lend themselves to peaceful coexistence. One side prevails or the other prevails. And the truth is that while the conservatives, in my judgment, we won the Cold War with political and economic communism. We've lost the cultural war with cultural Marxism, which I think has prevailed pretty much in the United States, or is now the dominant culture, whereas those of us who are traditionalists, we are, if you will, the counterculture. What exactly is cultural Marxism, the dominant culture of today? How did the founders of communism figure out a way to take over our country, not with guns and weapons, but with values and ideas? Let's take a closer look at this and see exactly how it happened. There was a man named Karl Marx. Marx got an idea. His idea was that the workers of the world should unite and rise up to counter an evil foe that foe being capitalism. Capitalism, the idea that people and private companies should be able to own the means of production and be free to earn and have as much as they wished was anathema to Marx. Marx felt the state should own the means of production as well as products produced, and then the state should distribute a fair share of all such products to each and every worker. Thus, in his book, The Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx thundered, Workers of the World Unite! Sure that he had a principle to unify all workers in every country, Marx looked forward to eventually taking over the world. Karl Marx believed that you would have a rebellion by the workers against the capitalist system, which would then create a Marxist communist society where you would have dictatorship of the proletariat. Unfortunately, when World War I broke out, the workers of the world did not unite. In fact, the workers united with their respective countries and fought each other. What happened was the Marxists had an enormous disillusionment when the French and the Germans and the British workers all rose up for the fatherland and went to war happily fighting one another. Marx's idea was a total failure. Workers were more loyal to their respective countries, churches, and cultural values than they were to their counterparts in other countries. They did not want to give up their houses, their cars, their stoves, their products. They did not want to have a classless society. Uh, they did not uh, vote, and they didn't even have an overthrow. Some years after Marx failed, several of his disciples got a new idea on how to take over the world. One of his disciples, Antonio Gramsci, while, where else but in prison, wrote up a series of plans, now known as the prison notebooks. In this plan, Gramsci announced, the workers of the world will unite only after the long march is over. The long march? 
In other words, they had to get into the culture and change the way of people's thinking. And if people were thinking about patriotism and nation and God and country, that was a mechanism which was too resistant to Marxism. It could never take hold. So you had to erode and destroy that in the individuals. That began what's called the long march through the institutions, through the seminaries, through the churches, through the media, through Hollywood, and all the rest of it to create an anti-Christian culture which would destroy the Christian beliefs and convictions in the vast majority of the people so they would embrace the ideas of Marxism and they would embrace the ideas that they had rejected and they would be open to a takeover basically by Marxists. Now not political Marxists, but cultural Marxists. Rather than workers uniting and marching into battle, thus seizing power through force, they would make a long march through the institutions. Institutions like the arts, cinema, theater, literature, schools, college, seminaries, newspapers, magazines, and what is now known as radio, TV, and the mass media. Once this march is over, all the barriers to the acceptance of Marxism will have been quietly and systematically removed. So to get to that point, they said we have to destroy the culture and what they were talking about was the Christian culture, uh, what we used to call Christendom or Western civilization. If you can break people away from religious affinities, for example, where they would turn to their community, their religious community for support and help, or they would turn to scripture for answers to certain perplexing questions. If they have an affinity to their religion, they might say, well, we're not going to go along with government because it's contrary to my religion. So cultural Marxism would attack religion of all kinds. doesn't make any difference because there was another place where people could go other than to the government for support and for answers. We the people will have thus been indoctrinated or brainwashed into seeing the wisdom of Marxism and the folly of capitalism. Thus, the door to socialism and communism will be open, and the door to a constitutional republic closed. Because the success of cultural Marxism means the demise of the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution is a set of principles. It's based ultimately on a moral code because you go back to the Declaration of Independence. What was the basis for the Declaration of Independence? The law of nature and of nature's God, right? The ultimate moral code. Uh, but if you don't follow those principles, if you try, as the expression goes, shave a point off here and there uh, to make a buck or to be reelected or for your special interest group to get some kind of a government subsidy, then the consequences are going to be in the long run deleterious to society as a whole. And there's the difficulty. There are too many people that are thinking in the short term and not applying these principles which are designed to give us a long term stability to this system.